Hello and welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. Now I know we don't normally meet like this at the start, but I wanted to explain something about tonight's show. See, what happens at the recordings is normally I go on stage before we start filming, just say hello to the audience, familiarise myself with them and them with me, do a bit of crowd work, you know, who enjoys elephants? Who here enjoys elephants? <laughs> How many giraffes do you think there are currently in the UK? How many giraffes do you think there are currently in the UK? The usual sort of thing. Thousand? Awful guess. Awful. <laughs> anyway, tonight, I also did a little thing where I lied to them. I told them that when we do the recording, we don't put real stuff on the screen, we do it all in green screen. Uh, and then somebody came up with the bright idea of doing the show in green screen instead. And they believed me. Here's how it went. Welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. My name is Dave Gorman. I've got a big screen, a remote control and a laptop full of things that I want to share with you. And I wanted to start tonight by considering what you may think is an old cliche, but we've all heard it, haven't we? You can't judge a book by... It's no, by its Amazon reviews, obviously. Look at <laughs> However, it is also true that you can judge a book by its title. And one man who knows that better than most is, of course, Alan Sugar. Look at his pudgy little face. <laughs> As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, he tweeted a little while ago, I've got a new book coming out in the autumn. It's about my ten years on British TV. I'm looking for suggestions for a title, see picture. And if you see the picture, you can see they were running a competition. Send us your suggestions. If we like it, we'll use it for Alan's book. I suppose it's quite a clever marketing thing for Alan Sugar to do, but it also leaves you open to all sorts of abuse. Especially if you're Alan Sugar. <laughs> so really, it's his own fault that people are sending him things like this. Pull my finger, make me fart. <laughs> How much sugar can Britain stand? And, worst of all, that one. Which, frankly, I'm surprised he retweeted because, to me, that looks a little bit racist. What the hell were they thinking? Obviously, they knew they'd be in for sarcasm online, but maybe Alan was just thinking, yeah, the British public will fall for anything. They're gullible. And perhaps people are getting more gullible as time goes on. In fact, in 2015, ladies and gentlemen, a comedian told an audience he was going to do a whole show on green screen and they believed him. <laughs> what the hell is going on there? Can't believe you fell for that. Why did you fall for that? Yeah, that'll be the you're fired picture, we get that one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My favourite part is the looks on some of your faces when you're thinking, did I just laugh at the thing that he's now told me is racist? <laughs> now, you may be wondering, why am I lying to you at the top of the show? The reason is I'm lying to you because I want you to experience what it's like to feel lied to. Because it's that emotion that I want to tap into. I want to talk about those moments in life where you feel like you've been lied to, even though sometimes you haven't even been lied to. There was no lie. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was a young man in my 20s. I was in Edinburgh and I went for a lunch with a friend at a little place called Café Rouge. And I had no idea that it was one of many Café Rouges. I didn't know it was a chain. I thought my friend and I had found a lovely little French place. <laughs> a, a little unique independent French restaurant in Edinburgh called Café Rouge. And we had a lovely lunch. It was fantastic. And I walked away from it thinking, oh, that's nice. Next time I'm in Edinburgh, I'll try to remember Café Rouge. <laughs> and then a few years later, maybe eight or nine years later, I was walking through London town and I passed a near identical Café Rouge. At which point, a click happened in my head and I went in, I looked at the back of a menu and saw that it was a chain. According to Wikipedia, there are now over 120 different Café Rouges in the UK. And all of a sudden, I felt like I'd been lied to eight years earlier. <laughs> As if it's somehow a chain's job to say, hello, welcome to a chain, we're not very unique, do come in and, and take a seat. <laughs> And that's not their job at all. They're allowed to be as good as they are. They don't have to be a little bit shit so you know that it's not an independent. <laughs> Some chains do feel like they're not chains and others feel very much like they are. I would say if, if you've eaten in a Bills, the first time you see one, you might well think that that's a little independent place. For me, giraffe doesn't quite do the same thing. In giraffe, I kind of know that I'm dealing with a chain. It just screams it. The architecture is telling me. And they're very similar sized chains. Bills, uh, they have apparently 65 different sites according to their website. And there are currently 63 giraffes in the UK. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 
There are, currently. Um... But the thing is, how does, how does one chain send one message and another chain a different message when they are ostensibly doing the same thing? Well, there is a place where you can find out how you do anything. There is a website called WikiHow, how to do anything. You might recognise the word wiki means that you can write this website. Most famously, I guess, Wikipedia is the best example of a wiki. You see, they get the pedia from encyclopedia, and the wiki means that anyone can edit it. And it's the same with WikiHow. WikiHow is a series of how-to guides that anyone can write or edit. And similarly, the Wiki Wiki Wild Wild West is a song about the Wild Wild West that anyone could have written. That is, <laughs> that is how that works. And as you can see, they have got nearly 190,000 different articles on WikiHow. They cover all sorts of topics, big things like how to save the environment and small things like how to get six-pack abs. Uh, Got to say, I'm quite glad that they have put the text on that screen explaining what it's about, because without the text, I would be wondering what the hell that is. <laughs> that... <laughs> it's a bit suspect, that, isn't it, really? I mean, you take the context away from that, and all of a sudden... <laughs> looks completely different, doesn't it? Honestly, you put him in a deck chair and he's just showing off. <laughs> and they do have an article that answers our question, how to make your name into a brand. Now, they've got seven steps for this. Uh, I don't think they needed seven, to be honest. I think they shouldn't have gone the full seven. I'll explain what I mean. I'll show you points one and two. Point number one, write out the first letter of your name. <laughs> Tip number two, do the rest of your name. <laughs> I could have edited that down myself. That's, that's one tip, isn't it? Write your name. <laughs> They do have a bit more detail. They flesh things out a little bit. Tip number one, write out the first letter of your name. You can do this in bubble letters, cursive, or decorate it with hearts or flowers. Although they haven't. They've just gone for a cursive M as the start of their example name. Uh, and tip number two, come back and add the decorations. I don't know where they think you've gone, but come back <laughs> and add the decorations. You can add colour too. Although they haven't added colour, they have just spelt out the name Mel and added a star. Tip number three, Try adding hearts, flowers, stripes, smileys, anything that you think makes it look personalised or cute is great. And they've illustrated that by adding a bit of colour and a bit of depth to it. At this point, I start thinking, is this really how to make your name into a brand? Or is this how to write your name on a pencil case when you're 12? <laughs> Convinced this is really how to turn your name into a brand? I mean, if you think of a, a British businessman who has successfully turned his name into a, a world beating brand, I don't know where your head goes, my brain reaches to Dyson. I don't think he would have sold quite so many vacuum cleaners if that had looked like that. that... <laughs> it's not doing it for me. I'm not going to show you every single point of this article. Trust me, it doesn't get any better. It carries on being equally as inane and ridiculous throughout the rest of the thing. What is the point of having 190,000 articles if this is one of them? This is the thing with this website. WikiHow is about opinions. If you've got a different opinion, you write your own WikiHow page. That's how this one works. Which is why you end up in a ridiculous situation of having articles called How to Act Like a Mermaid. <laughs> I'm no expert here, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm pretty sure that walking the walk is not going to be a <laughs> crucial part of it. And how to act like a mermaid at school. <laughs> As if that's a different article to the first. There's also how to make people believe you're a mermaid at school and also how to secretly act like a mermaid at school. As well as how to write a mermaid diary to trick your friends, how to look like a mermaid, how to act like a fictional mermaid, because hitherto the mermaids have been real, for crying out loud, and how to pretend to be a fake mermaid without your mom knowing. <laughs> this is preposterous. They've also got articles like this one. How to enjoy elephants. <laughs> to enjoy elephants. Even though elephants are one of the most spectacular animals in the world, many people do not like them. This article should help you enjoy elephants better. <laughs> Who needs to enjoy elephants better? There are some things in life, you know, I can imagine maybe you're, you're 30 or 40 years into your marriage and maybe something has clicked and you're, you're not quite enjoying your sex life anymore but you're very much in love with your partner and you know that it's a healthy thing to do and you want to but it's not happening in your head. Maybe, yeah, an article on how to reconnect and, and to re-enjoy sex, that, that would make sense to me. But an article on how to enjoy elephants... <laughs> If you don't enjoy elephants, just carry on. No-one's going to ever know. <laughs> There's 
There's no need. It's not healthy or unhealthy. This is not a thing that is missing in your life. Again, I can't show you every single tip, uh, but you want to pay attention, sir. What's your name, by the way? Chris. Chris, OK. This is one of the tips for you, Chris. It's how to enjoy elephants. Tip number four, write down all the good things <laughs> elephants can do for us. OK, Chris? Try to make a list of more than five. <laughs> Do you know what we're going to do, Chris? We're going to have a little break right now, but only so that you can write this list. <laughs> Try and get more than five if you can, and we'll come back and see how you did after this short break. Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish. My name is Dave Gorman. And if you remember, before the break, I sent Chris here some elephant-based homework. I asked him to write a list of what elephants can do for us, and here is what he gave me. <laughs> I asked for more than five, Chris. You've only given me two. <laughs> they make a passable car wash for the Flintstones... <laughs> ..and an important part of a piano. Earlier on, I was talking to you about those moments when you feel like you've been lied to, even though no lie has occurred, and yet you still have that feeling in your gut. There are other situations where I think the reverse is true, where someone has lied to you, and the correct way to respond would be to shrug and say, well, that's not true. But instead, you don't. I'm thinking about times like this. Now, I'm not going to say these words. I find these words distasteful. But every now and then, someone in temper will say something like the following. And some people think that saying that is an incitement to violence. For some people, if you ask someone, why did you hit that man? If they said, well, you'll never guess what he said to me, he said, huh? you would think, well, fair enough, I can see why you hit him. I'm not convinced that that is acceptable. Unless whoever is saying it is your father <laughs> or, or one of the many gentlemen callers at your mother's house. <laughs> They basically don't know whether this is true or not. This happened to me once. I, I was on holiday. I was in Spain, driving on the wrong side of the road from my brain. I made a little mistake, cut somebody up. Some driver wound down his window, hurled all sorts of Spanish abuse at me. I said, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm English. At which point, in English, he said the following. And I did not think, how dare you? I thought, no, no, she's not. <laughs> Then went on with my day. It's absolutely fine. Because when someone says that, what they're really saying is, I am trying to upset you. And if someone on the street having a row with you suddenly went, Oi, I'm trying to upset you, you'd think, that's a weird thing to do. <laughs> you just shrug your shoulder and get on with your day, wouldn't you? And the truth is, when someone says that, they might as well be saying, Your cousin is a dentist, for all it really matters. <laughs> It's just a statement of non-fact, isn't it? They might as well be saying, your dentist is a Libra, for all that it matters. They might as well be saying, your brother is a printer, or your printer is a brother. Although, obviously, <laughs> sometimes that is actually true, sometimes. So. <laughs> Although I wish they had taken my advice and done that, just think. <laughs> just think of the success that could have come their way. <laughs> the point is, it's not true. And I understand that it's not a nice thing. I'm not saying it's OK to say those words, but there's no need for anyone to take it as anything other than I am trying to upset you. In which case, just brush it off and walk on. Of course, it's not always a personal insult. That's just one of the many triggers. People have all sorts of different triggers. For some people, it is a personal insult. For other people, it can be, for example, seeing your flag burn. For other people, it can be some kind of Danish cartoon. It could be all manner of things. <laughs> <laughs> they could really screw me in the edit at this point. <laughs> this could be all manner of things. I'm not excusing these things. Just as I'm not excusing someone who says the following. They're all horrible things, but they're not really reasons for violence in my understanding. If it's a flag, well, the flag is a symbol, isn't it? Now, I, I feel genuinely like a patriot. I feel patriotic. But the Union Jack... It just doesn't move me very much. I haven't been imbued with reverence for it as a symbol, so I just don't feel very much. In incidentally, I know that I have called this the Union Jack, and I know that we will get complaints. <laughs> there will always be a stiff letter telling you that it's actually the Union flag, and it's only the Union Jack when it's on a ship. <laughs> <Et cetera. laughs> to those people, I say this, get over it. <laughs> 
If the world wants to call that a Union Jack, then that is now what a Union Jack is. By the same token, let me say that that is Big Ben, and that is a vegetable, and that is a couple of pints. <laughs> <laughs> and incidentally, incidentally, so is that. Now, <laughs> My point is that that is a symbol and you respond differently to symbols depending on the way you've been raised. In America, I understand entirely that they have a different emotional relationship with their flag. Of course they do. That's because they have the Pledge of Allegiance. Literally, a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States. It is said at the start of every congressional session. It is said in school at the start of every school day. You can't say those words and salute the flag every day of your childhood and not emerge from that, having formed some kind of emotional bond to that symbol. A symbol that we haven't done the equivalent thing in, in Britain, have we? We have a different cultural understanding of what a flag represents. I mean, obviously, we have some things in common. We understand the broad idea of patriotism. I mean, if you see that picture there, <laughs> you all understand that that is Richard Branson showing off his patriotism. You might not buy it, you might think it's gimmicky, but you know that what it represents is patriotic. I am British. And if you see that picture there, you know that means that man has recently mugged Richard Branson. <laughs> But by the same token, we would understand, I think, through British eyes, that just looks like the most patriotic thing that Katy Perry could do. She's actually performing at a show called the VH1 Divas Salute the Troops there. She is saluting the troops. She is wearing the stars and stripes. I'm sure most British people would see that and think that is an act of patriotism. But not everyone in America would see it that way. He got a reaction like this on Twitter from someone. Katy Perry should hang her head in shame. The flag code clearly says that it should not be used as wearing apparel. And there is a link to the rules explaining that you shouldn't do that. The same person goes on to say, by wearing that outfit, Katy Perry was clearly insulting the troops. She was supposed to be <laughs> saluting. <laughs> when I saw that. If you look it up, there is a flag code. This is the, a legal page all about it. And as you can see, it does indeed say that it should never be used as wearing apparel. And to the people who are offended by that, to them, Katy Perry is a serial offender. She does it all the time. In a world where otherwise sane Americans are apparently insulted by actions such as this, it is no surprise that some people think you definitely cannot burn the flag. If you're going to be upset by people who are attempting to honour the flag and just doing it a bit wrong, then people who are clearly deliberately attempting to dishonour the flag are going to really get your goat, aren't they? This is why this person says that, and these people say that you should be shot for burning the flag. This is serious stuff. This is hardly an eye for an eye, is it? This is a different exchange rate altogether. This is an eye for an eye if it was run by Wonga, basically. This is... <laughs> something else entirely. I had a friend who was at college in the States, and his dorm, they had a flag that was attached to the bit where he was staying. And he got really upset at one point because the flag got a bit weather-beaten, it got all tatty, and that, he was told, was disrespectful. You can't hang a tatty flag. He was told to take it down. And then he went to put it in the trash, and they said, no, you can't put a flag in the trash. That is disrespectful. And he didn't know how he was supposed to dispose of this flag. I was talking to him one time, he said, what do I do? I said, well, there is a website that can help you to do absolutely <laughs> anything. And it does indeed have an article on how to dispose of an American flag when it's damaged, ladies and gentlemen. I will instead show it you on the US flag code, the official rules which say very, very clearly, the flag, when it is in such condition that it is no longer a fitting emblem for display, should be destroyed in a dignified way, preferably by burning. <laughs> It's a complicated world, folks. It's a complicated world. Let's just take a moment to digest that information. I'll see you after the break. To modern life is good, ladies and gentlemen, where we have been talking about how you respond to lies, about how you respond to not being lied to as well. But now I want to talk about how it feels when you are lied about by someone who doesn't even know you exist. That needs explaining. I'll show you what I'm talking about. I received an email a little while ago from an interested party with the subject heading Tinder. <laughs> I was immediately interested. The email says, Hi, Dave. This is going to sound a bit weird, but are you on Tinder? <laughs> Long story short, 
I am on Tinder and I recently saw someone who looked suspiciously like you on there. If you are on Tinder and using a fake name, don't worry, I won't say anything. <laughs> That's very sweet of them. I screen grabbed my phone, but I can't see a way of attaching a picture to your email form, so let me know if you want to know more. I obviously wanted <laughs> to know more. But first, I, I think it's only fair that I should explain what Tinder is. It's, it's a dating app. I didn't really know about Tinder. I was uh, married in 2010, and I think Tinder was created in 2012, so I have no first-hand experience of it. It seems likely there will be other people here who don't really know what Tinder is, and probably a fair percentage of people here who are with people and who are pretending they don't know what Tinder is. <laughs> So for all of those people, let me explain. Basically, it's a dating app that uses where you are, because it goes with you, and it's on your phone. So what happens is, you, you tell it who you are, and you tell it who you're interested in. So you might say, I'm interested in men, or I'm in women, or I'm interested in, in both, and you can say what age range, between 21 and 27, or whatever, and you can tell it that you want to see people within a five-mile radius of you, or a 10-mile radius, or a 15-mile radius, or whatever. Uh, basically, it looks a little like that. Um, now... <laughs> I am not suggesting that he is on Tinder. As far as I know, he's not on Tinder. But if you were on Tinder and you had said you were interested in men and you were saying, I don't know, men between 65 and 70 and you wanted someone in Essex or whatever, maybe that would show up on your phone. Then what you do is you decide whether you like the look of them or not. And if you like the look of them, you think yes, you swipe to the right. And if you don't like the look of them, you swipe to the left. Now, if he has seen you, and he has also swiped to the right, then you will be put in touch with each other if you swipe to the right. But if he swiped to the left, you'll never know. He might never have seen you. So it only puts matches in touch with each other. I would worry about the swipe left if you don't like and swipe right if you do. I would think, if you're a fuss pot, if you're just going, no, 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 then at some point, doesn't that become a muscle memory thing? Doesn't your instinct kick in? Because only, for example, right, none of these people are on Tinder, but if, if you're looking at Tinder... <laughs> And you see that, and you think, oh, no, I don't like that. And you swipe to the left, and then you see that, and you swipe to the left, and then you see that, and then you see him, you swipe to the left, and then you get him, and you swipe to the left. You're getting into the habit now. It's just, you're not even really thinking about it. You're just swiping to the left. And then you see that, and you swipe to the left, and think, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. And then you swipe to the right, and now you've liked him. It's not bringing him back. They're not in a queue. It's not moving. They're just gone. They're gone for good when you've done that. You'll never see them again. Anyway, back to the story. They want to know if I want to know more. And, of course, I want to know more. So I got in touch and they sent me a bit more information and the screen grab that they had taken from Tinder, which is of that man there. <laughs> and that, that isn't someone who looks like me. That is me. I know it's me because I know the photo. I remember the photo. It's not the photo I would have used. I would have used that, to be honest. <laughs> I reckon that would have been much more successful, but no. <laughs> That's the one they have gone with. This is the context of, of the photo. It was originally used on a, an article in The Independent. Uh, he's cropped it on Tinder, and I can see why. That's the original photo. Uh, it's hard to see, but the detail is there if you zoom in. I am wearing a wedding ring in that photo, so probably not the best photo to have as your Tinder profile picture. But cropping it isn't necessarily the best thing to do either, because I think he's just made it look like I'm having a shit. <laughs> A smug shit, admittedly, but still. <laughs> Meanwhile, back on Tinder. This is this man. Someone called Ed. I was determined to track him down. But to track him down, I've obviously got to find out where he is. The person who originally found him on Tinder, they were visiting the West End of London on a Friday night when they saw him on Tinder. So to try and find out where he really is, I wanted to find other people who could find him. So I blogged about it. I basically explained what was going on and I appealed to people, saying, look, if you're in London and you see this man on Tinder, Tell me where you were when he showed up and tell me how big your radius is on Tinder and then I will try and triangulate the sightings and hopefully I will pin him down. <laughs> I will tell you how I got on, but later in the show. Because right now I want to talk about another kind of lie. The kind of lie that might or might not even be a lie. If you're watching a film and there's an action scene where a, a stunt double has stood in for Tom Cruise and you know it's not really Tom Cruise, but you're OK with that, aren't you? You don't sit there at home feeling lied to that he didn't do that. It's part of the performance. But what about when dogs are involved? <laughs> I'm talking, of course, ladies and gentlemen, about the Britain's Got Talent scandal of 2015. 
The show was won by an act called Jules and Matisse. Jules is a human being. Matisse is a dog. There they are next to Simon Cowell. In the act, the dog is wanted for stealing sausages, and in the little drama that unfolds on the stage, we see the dog get arrested for stealing some sausages by Jules, who's dressed as a policewoman. She puts it into the police station as if it's going to jail, and then there is a daring jailbreak, and we see the dog crawling along two wires or ropes between one window and another. And then we find out that the dog was stealing sausages for its lover, who turns out to be a three-legged dog. At which point, the audience's hearts melt and Jules and Matisse win the series and take home the £250,000 prize. <laughs> but then, people discovered that there was more than one dog and the dog that was put inside the jail wasn't the same dog that walked across the ropes. It was a different dog. It was a stunt dog. <laughs> and Britain was appalled that a woman had trained two dogs and not one. <laughs> I don't know if I can break this to them, but I found out she's not even a real policewoman. <laughs> there was outrage. There were a thousand complaints. <laughs> this was a big story. There it is in the Telegraph. There it is in the Independent. Even the Radio Times got involved, dubbing it Doggate. Although, I'm not sure they should be calling that Doggate, because I think we all know that that is a Doggate. <laughs> the world was all a flutter with comments. And you know me, ladies and gentlemen. I quite like it when people get upset about things they really shouldn't bother getting upset about. I visited at least a dozen news sites where this was under discussion. I took my favourite comments that I could find there beneath those stories, and I've turned them, ladies and gentlemen, into something that I like to call a found poem, which I would like to perform for you now. I am apoplectic with rage at this cover-up. I pay my ITV licence fee in good faith. <laughs> I do not expect to have the wool pulled over my eyes in this manner. Thankfully, I never watch Britain's Got Talent. <laughs> and now I never will. I don't know much about the world, but I do know this. Someone using a secret dog in their act is a con artist, plain and simple and a con artist simply cannot be presented to the royal family <laughs> under any circumstances. <laughs> the show is a farce and should be renamed Britain's Got Dog Act. <laughs> Personally, I am ashamed to belong to a nation that favours dogs over human people. <laughs> My thoughts are with the people that really matter right now. Ashley and Pudsey. <laughs> the sooner this show is axed, the better. And they can take the X-Files with it. <laughs> Ashley, and to a greater extent Pudsey, had nothing to do with this. But their names will inevitably be dragged through the mud because of it. And an innocent dog shouldn't have to be dragged through the mud for no reason. <laughs> I voted. And I'm ashamed to say that I voted for the Dog Act. I did it because I was moved to tears by the three-legged dog at the end. With hindsight, <laughs> I find myself asking, what kind of person would use a three-legger? to tug at the audience's heartstrings like that. <laughs> the answer is clear. The same kind of person who would use a secret dog to walk on ropes. <laughs> That's who. So am I the only one wondering how the three-legged dog lost a leg? <laughs> Did Jules chop it off? <laughs> if this fiasco proves anything, it's that she is more than capable of such a heinous crime. <laughs> oh, do get a grip and stop being such a negative Nancy. <laughs> if you don't like the result, there is nothing to stop you training your own dog for next year. <laughs> not going to bother? No, I thought not. <laughs> it's easy to talk the talk, but none of you are ready to walk that talk, are you? The only thing this scandal reveals is that a woman trained three dogs and not two. She has displayed 50% more talent than she has officially been rewarded for. 
I don't care that Jules lied about Matisse doing all the stunts. I do care that they live in Belgium. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the B in BGT doesn't stand for Belgium. <laughs> I thank you. The Bill Ross Green Cortez, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back after the break. Gentlemen, I'm Dave Gorman and this is Modern Life is Goodish. And you'll remember that earlier on I was telling you about someone who I've discovered has been using my face on Tinder. Now let me be very clear, at no point did I think he knew he was using my face. If you think about it, if you know what I do for a living, then you know that because of what I do for a living, it makes it less likely that you'll get away with what you're doing because other people might know it. So I'm guessing he's just never heard of me, which many people haven't. He probably just did a Google image search on very sexy man or something like that. <laughs> and, and just randomly got that picture. I've posted my blog explaining how I'm going to try and track him down. Uh, and this has kind of worked. Uh, a few people have seen him. This blog has been read by more than 14,000 people. And because of that, I have now had, I think, 17 or 18 different sightings. Uh, the first one, apart from the, the first person who told me about him in London, came from someone on the blog. They left a comment on the blog saying that they had seen him, but he was local to Manchester. Uh, they go on to say, uh, I swipe left, though. Sorry, no offence. <laughs> <laughs> little... Just a little bit of offence. I then had an email from someone who said that they had seen him in Nottingham, and then I had a third sighting from someone who had seen him in Mottingham. <laughs> which I assumed was a typo. I wrote back saying, do you mean Nottingham? And they wrote back saying, definitely not Mottingham. Mottingham is in London. And apparently it is. It's down there, that's map of London. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 I can't stop it doing that. For context, just so you know, Mottingham is down there. It's kind of near Lewisham and Greenwich. So now I've had three fresh sightings. The first in Manchester, the second in Nottingham, and the third in Mottingham. <laughs> At which point, the smart money for a fourth is going to be Nanchester. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Although, <laughs> it turns out... It turns out the smart money is being stupid because Manchester doesn't exist. There's no, no such place. I did get a few clusters of sightings that would kind of help me to track him down in some way. Uh, that's the, the Mottingham one, and I know the radius that that person was working on. That was one sighting. I also had a sighting of him from someone who was in Seven Oaks, and that's the radius they were using. And as you can see, that immediately offers up a tantalising glimpse that maybe that person could be in Orpington and be being seen by both those people. He could be in what can only be called the Orpington cleavage at that point. <laughs> where, where that suggests. But that wasn't the only cluster. North West London proved more promising. One person, they were in Brent Cross Shopping Centre when they got a swipe and saw him on Tinder. Um, and that was the radius they were working on. Somebody else was in Muswell Hill at home and they got a sighting. And again, as you can see, offers up a tantalising glimpse of cleavage, doesn't it? But I had another sighting that is relevant to this one. Someone in Watford. And maybe, if you live in Watford, you're a bit less fussy about how far you'll travel... <laughs> And someone who lives in London. Maybe someone in London thinks, I'm not leaving London. I live in a city with millions of people. Why would I have to leave? And people in Watford might be thinking, yeah, I'm prepared to travel into London for love. Maybe that's how it works, because this person had a far <laughs> bigger radius. And look at that. That really pins it down. If this is accurate, I've got his bloody address out of this one. <laughs> He could well be in that little pink triangle there. And what is Tinder for if not to try and get in someone's little pink triangle? <laughs> that, surely, surely the point. If this is accurate, this is strongly suggesting that this person could be in Finchley. OK, now, to track him down, I've got to make contact with him. And to make contact with him, I've got to be what he's looking for on Tinder and he is looking for women, so I needed a female Tinder profile. So I turned to Mrs Gorman... <laughs> ..and I said, Mrs Gorman, you're, you're not on Tinder, are you? <laughs> and she said, of, of course not. Why, why, why do you ask? I said, well, would you mind if I put you on Tinder? <laughs> I said, yes, I bloody would mind. What are you talking about? What's happened to our marriage? I said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm just trying to track a man down. Said, this is not helping. What are you on about? <laughs> so 
so I explained. I said, look, there's this man, he's pretending to be me on Tinder. I need to track him down, so I need to pretend to be a woman on Tinder. She said, look, okay, fine. You can put me on Tinder on two conditions. It is online for the briefest possible time. The minute you have found him, you delete that profile. Second condition, I get to choose what photo you use. It is a picture of me. I have to have some say in that. <laughs> this was the picture she chose. This is one of our wedding photos. <laughs> She's crawling into my heart and ripping my saying, oh, yeah, you can go and play if you like. Go and play on Tinder, mate, but you're not forgetting you're bloody married to me. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's my job to crop myself out of my own wedding photo <laughs> so that I can use that as an avatar on Tinder. So I've created a profile in the name of my good lady wife with her face on it. That's what it looks like. Uh, and that has become my avatar for her that's me on Tinder. So then I go off to Finchley in my car with my phone with Mrs Gorman's Tinder profile on it. <laughs> And I adjusted my settings. I'm trying to track him down. I think he's in Finchley. So I've adjusted my settings. I'm saying I'm looking for men. And my search distance, as small as I can get it, two miles. And I've gone for the ages of 31 to 35, because we know that Ed is saying that he is 32. And then I just start flicking through people's Tinder profiles as if I am my wife. <laughs> which is one of the strangest, but also most powerful things you can do. <laughs> get out of here, merchant banker. <laughs> Get out of here, fireman. Get out of here, muscle man. <laughs> She's got an older, chubbier man with a beard that she prefers more. Yeah, get out of here. She's not interested. It was fantastic. Although every now and then I was thinking, oh, maybe. <laughs> and then remembering what I was actually doing. Just swiping left, swiping left, swiping left. And then eventually, after about eight hours, this showed up on my phone. I was so excited. I felt like a teenage woman seeing the love of her life for the first time. <laughs> Heart skipping a beat, thinking it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm on to him. I swiped right, which felt like a bit of an ego wank, but I did it. I, I swiped right. <laughs> and I discovered that I had a match. He had seen me and had also swiped right, not knowing that he'd swiped right on the person whose face he was using, his wife. <laughs> I'm not even sure if that sentence made sense, but we know what I'm saying. <laughs> so now I've got to try and make contact with him. This is me starting the conversation. I've gone in with, hi, Ed, what are you up to? He replies, hey, not much, how are you? And this is the first time the fact that he's using my face has really offended me. <laughs> A capital U. Yeah. Type the word out, man. Do it properly. If you're going to pretend to be me, bloody be me. <laughs> To be honest with you, Ed's stuff is riddled with grammatical mistakes. I'm not going to pick them all up, but just know when you see them, they are getting to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, thanks. I'm new to Tinder. A little nervous. You're my first match. To which he replied, lol. <laughs> I have never typed lol in my life. I didn't know how to respond to a lol that I didn't understand, so I just went, lol. <laughs> That's my first ever lol. <laughs> and then he typed, lol. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know how long this is going to go on for, but I'm not going to be the one to stop it, so I went, lol. <laughs> At this stage, you know what? A little part of me was falling for him. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I like a man who can make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> this is obviously quite a complicated story to tell. I'm going to make it a bit less complicated, uh, if I can, for the other conversations. I'm going to split the screen in two, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll try and explain as clearly as I can. On that side of the screen, we have Ed. Who is Ed? Well, Ed is a person of unknown gender who doesn't realise he's having a conversation with the person whose face he has stolen. <laughs> he thinks he's talking to a woman called Beth. He doesn't know that the face of the woman he thinks he's talking to belongs to the person he's married to the person whose face he's pretending to have, OK? <laughs> Where on this side, we've got Beth, who is actually me, <laughs> who is a person of male gender who's pretending to be his own wife. <laughs> Hopefully, this is making it much less complicated for you. <laughs> And you'll all understand the conversation from here on in, OK? Uh, we join it with, I like your photo. I like yours, too.
even if it does look like you're on the toilet. <laughs> Does it? Huh, yeah. Prob a bit. <laughs> you look really familiar, like someone I know. <laughs> got one of them faces, maybe. <laughs> no, mate, you've got my face. <laughs> I'm getting nowhere here. I'm getting absolutely nowhere. He's not giving me very much in this exchange. So I decided to go the more direct route in a third conversation. I'm going straight in this time. So, do you want to meet up sometime? Cos that's all I'm interested in. I want to know who this bugger is. <laughs> yeah, sure. What do you fancy? It's getting exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I'm on to him. It's gonna happen. How about London Zoo? <laughs> do you enjoy elephants? <laughs> Random. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'm on fire. At this point, I am very, very excited about what might be about to happen. I've been out of the dating game for a while, but I've not lost it. Look at this. I'm working this game. No, I'm not going to tease you. I'm afraid the excitement is not going to last. You will, you will all soon see why. I suggest tomorrow afternoon. Would love to, he replies. But I can't right now. In a bad situation. Bit embarrassing. Oh, no. What's up? Bit embarrassing. Got robbed last week. Got no money at the moment. And I think I might get kicked out of my apartment. I wouldn't normally ask, but I feel close to you. <laughs> Must have been all that lolling we did earlier. <laughs> and then the clincher. Could you wire me some money just till next week. At which point, clearly, no one in this room thinks that I am ever going to meet this human being face to face, do they? Because nobody in the history of the internet who has ever asked you to wire me some money has ever been interested in any kind of face to face meeting. I did try. I tried all sorts of things. I said, look, I'll give you some money, come to the zoo, I'll meet you there. And, and give me your bank account and I'll transfer it over. I was trying to fish for details. I wanted to be able to report him to the right authorities. The only thing he would give me was a Western Union transfer something or other that I'm not allowed to put on the screen because the lawyers here are worried that some people watching will be stupid enough to send him some money. <laughs> I fished and fished as much as I could to get whatever information I could find. I didn't get very much. And as you can see, it didn't end well between me and Ed. Um, <laughs> but it is nice. It's nice to be loved. <laughs> Albeit for such a short space of time. <laughs> and it achieved the one thing it was meant to achieve, which is that Ed deleted his account about three seconds after telling me to go away. Um, <laughs> and I went home from Finchley, dwelling on what had transpired and thinking, my wife was asleep at home, and yet happy for me to be elsewhere masquerading as her on a dating app <laughs> whilst trying to track down a strange man. That is a wonderful wife. That is trust of the highest level. You simply cannot argue with that. I went home and she was asleep in bed, and I thought I'm married to the most amazing woman on earth. I lay down in bed beside her and I just gave her a, a little gentle caress. Actually, it wasn't like that. I made sure I swiped right. <laughs> All of which I think, ladies and gentlemen, proves that modern life is decidedly gutish. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>